Thanks, Amanda. I've got to get a couple of props ready for this morning. Got a few little bits and pieces in my bag I'm going to be bringing out. One of the things that the Lord spoke to me um, during the praise and worship today is that the story of Passover and communion didn't actually begin um, with Israel being captive in Egypt. It actually began a lot earlier. It actually began in the Garden of Eden. And the reason it began in the Garden of Eden was that was when our relationship with God was first broken. And the whole basis of communion, everything that we do in communion and Passover, the whole story of, uh, of the Bible actually is about, it's a message of restoration. That's, that's the basis of Passover and communion. I've got a, a series of slides that we're going to be looking at today as well as we go through this. So this is not going to be so much a preach, I'm not going to preach, I'm going to teach. This is going to be information, so you're going to get a lot of information um, I've got far too much information, so I'm going to have to skim over some of it pretty quickly because otherwise we'll be here for hours. But I, I'm sure you'll find this really fascinating today as we go through this. And I'm going to set up a couple of things here just so that I'm going to be on track. So just give me a mo. There's a bit more in here. This is, this is a very important piece as well just looks like a normal serviette, but it actually uh, is going to serve a, a bigger purpose than that and a couple of other things here. So that's it. Let me just... Going to get in here. So the other thing to understand about communion and the Passover is it's a, it's a message of love. It really is um, God actually demonstrating his love for us through Passover and communion. So let's just go to the first slide and understand the context of, uh, of communion and where it begins. So Passover itself is a very ancient feast. So the feast of Passover didn't start in the Garden of Eden, but it, the reason or the purpose behind Passover started then. But even today, the Passover feast... Communion has a history that spans more than three and a half thousand years. And once again, the Passover feast was set in the context of Egypt and everything that was going on in Egypt at that time. So I want to read scripture now, and we're going to read the same scripture that I shared last week, which is Exodus chapter 12, verses 1 to 14. So this is where the whole basis of the Passover and the Passover feast was actually put in place. And what I want to emphasize today is that when we uh, look at the Passover and when we look at communion, you would have seen on the title slide, it's about remembering the past, but also prophesying the future. And today when we take communion, we're not only remembering the past, we're still prophesying the future because everything that's encapsulated in communion has not yet taken, fully taken place. And we'll um, explain all of that a little bit further. So in Exodus chapter 12, we read, The Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron in Egypt. This month is to be the first month of the year for you. In fact, it's interesting because... Uh, the Jewish, uh, Jewish people actually have two new years. So Passover, if you like, is the first feast of seven feasts. And it occurs in the first month of the year. And yet the Jewish New Year starts tomorrow. Uh, Rosh Hashanah, the Feast of Trumpets. And that's a two-day feast that starts tomorrow. And I'll share a little bit more about that later as well. So says, give these instructions to the whole community of Israel. On the tenth day of this month, each man must choose either a lamb or a young goat for his household. If his family is too small to eat a whole animal, he and his next door neighbor may share an animal in proportion to the number of people and the amount that each person can eat. You may choose either a sheep or a goat, but it must be a one-year-old male without any defects. And then on the evening of the fourteenth day of the month, the whole community of Israel will kill the animals. The people are to take some of the blood and put it on the doorposts and above the doors of the houses in which the animals are to be eaten. 
That night, the meat is to be roasted and eaten with bitter herbs and with bread made without yeast. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled, but eat it roasted, whole, including the head, the legs, and the internal organs. You must not leave any of it until morning. If any is left over, it must be burnt. You are to eat it quickly, for you are to be dressed for travel with your sandals on your feet and your walking stick in your hand. It is the Passover festival to honor me, the Lord. On that night, I will go through the land of Egypt, killing every firstborn male, both human and animal, and punishing all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. The blood on the doorposts will be assigned to mark the houses in which you live. When I see the blood, I will pass over you and will not harm you when I punish the Egyptians. You must celebrate this day as a religious festival to remind you of what I, the Lord, have done. Celebrate it for all time to come. Okay, so the story of the Passover, some of the things to take note of in relation to the Passover. First, it's a highly symbolic celebration. It's the first of seven Jewish feasts, and all the symbols have some relationship to God's supernatural hand and the supernatural things that God has done. So the Jews celebrate the Passover with what's known as the cedar meal. And when we do communion, we just take um, a wafer and a a bit of grape juice. But the Passover was instigated around a meal. And one of the things that we often don't really consider in the church is that when Jesus took the Last Supper and instigated what we now call communion, that was a meal. It was actually a Jewish feast. And they were sitting, reclining at a table, going through a meal. And in fact, they were going through a fairly lengthy document. One of the things I'll show you at this point is that if you were a traditional Jewish family and you were going through a Passover meal, here's the instructions. It's 100 pages. (coughs) Well, not quite, 98 including the cover. So this is uh, put together by, you know, um, uh, you know, senior rabbis and things like that. And in, in this document, it contains not only all the instructions, but all the psalms and everything that is actually read and the songs that are sung and everything like that. So even when you read the gospel and it says after supper they sang a song and then they went out into the garden, well, guess what? The song's in here. This little book is called um, the Haggadah. Um, and I've written down what that means and I've forgotten Um, but uh, so they they actually go through this and they actually go through it's like a, a liturgy that they actually go through but something else to understand is that the Lord's Supper is not like you might call a a liturgical thing it's actually a joyous feast it's a very joyous feast so um, each symbol obviously has a hidden meaning and I'm just going to touch on some of those hidden meanings. We haven't got time to go into the detail of all the hidden meanings, but we'll touch on them. And of course, it's a story of redemption. And the story of redemption is something that we're to um, personalize because it's a, a story of our individual redemption. It's not just the story of redemption of the nation of Israel. The you know When the first sin that was committed and we were separated from God, that was just two individuals. That wasn't a nation. That was Adam and Eve. And that was when our relationship with God was broken, it was severed for all time. So God, ever since then, has had a plan that he's put into place to try and restore, redeem man to himself, redeem us individually, not just as a nation, but individually. The Passover is powerfully prophetic. And within the Passover, what you'll find is that... uh, Everything to do with Jesus and his life and times on the cross is all prophesied in the Passover meal. So the Jews have actually been prophesying for three and a half thousand, well, for thousands of years, they were foretelling the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ through the Passover meal. Very powerful prophetic symbols. Some things to note about the Passover. Firstly, it's for the whole community. The central item is a male lamb. Interesting, it could be either a sheep or a goat, but it was a lamb. One year old, the entire animal is consumed. It had to be free of defects. It's killed. Another word for killing something is sacrificing it. And its blood is shed. 
There was blood put on doorposts. All of these are in this scripture that we read in Exodus. The lamb's eaten with bitter herbs and unleavened bread. It's done to honor the Lord. It brings judgment to the land of Egypt. It delivers Israel from judgment. Death passes over. It's a celebration that remembers what the Lord has done. And it has to be done for all time to come. So let's look at some of the prophetic significance in the Passover pictures. Today you might say the whole community is the church. The male lamb is Jesus. Free of defects is the sinless, spotless lamb of God. Killed and the blood is shed. Well, Jesus was killed and his blood was shed for the removal of sins. Blood on the doorposts would signify that there was blood on the cross, not only embracing. And the other thing about this, it's only embracing the blood that saves. It was the blood on the doorposts and the lintel of the door that caused death to pass over the Israelites. They had to have faith in the blood. Passover was still a meal that was taken by faith, believing that when they actually did this by faith, that death would pass over. And the other thing is, if the Israelites had not put the blood on the doorposts and on the lintels, they would have been subject to the same judgment as the Egyptians. Okay? So the only way into the kingdom of heaven is through the blood of Christ. And anyone who doesn't embrace the blood is going to suffer the same judgment as everybody else. They will be subject to death. So the lamb's roasted, it's not boiled. This signifies a couple of things. It can signify God's wrath that's exercised in judgment, but also it signifies a peace offering. There were other offerings that were given that were all consumed by fire, and they were peace offerings. So Jesus, um, God's wrath was placed upon Jesus in judgment for sin, but Jesus is also the peace offering. Bitter herbs speaks of the sin of the world being upon Jesus. They speak of the bitterness of slavery. Of course, for the Israelites, it was the bitterness of slavery in Egypt. For us, it speaks of the bitterness of slavery to sin and bondage to the kingdom of darkness. Unleavened bread speaks of the sinless lamb of God that is broken and pierced. And what I'll do, I want to show you something here. This this box, this is a box of box of um, matzah and um, this particular matzah not all matzah is equal this is Passover matzah you can buy a box of matzah but unless it's kosher matzah that's been specifically prepared for Passover it's you can't eat it on Passover even though it might be unleavened so the Jews are extremely particular about what matzah you may and may not use on Passover so a sheet of matzah just looks like this. So it's a square piece of unleavened bread. And and the important thing to note about this piece of unleavened bread, it has both stripes and holes in it. So for thousands of years, when the Jews were eating this matzah, and part of the Jewish Passover is one of these sheets is broken. So they're breaking effectively the body of Christ. During the um, Passover celebration, They'll eat a lot of matzah, but there will be a special um, pouch that's custom made, and in that pouch will be three pieces of matzah, just like that. And when they actually go through the Passover feast, what they do is they take the middle one and they break the middle matzah in half, and it snaps easily. And what this represents is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So they never broke the top or the bottom piece. They always remained intact throughout the meal. It was only the middle one, Jesus Christ, whose body was broken for us. What they do with half of this, they'd take a cloth and they'd wrap up half of this and then they'd go and take it and they'd hide it in the house. And once again, this is all part of the Jewish feast. What they're actually doing, they're taking the body of Christ and they're placing it in a tomb. Just as Jesus Christ was buried in a tomb, so this gets buried somewhere in the house. And whilst the rest of the family, whilst the adults are eating the Passover meal, the children get to go and look for the piece that's broken. It's called the Hakifaman, 
Hafikaman, Jewish word, and um, they go and hunt for this. And when it's found, it's brought back to the leader at the table so that it can be redeemed. What a great word, hey? The redemption all through the body and the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. So the Passover feast speaks of delivering, um, oh, sorry, of bringing judgment to Egypt. Well, we know that the prophetic sign is judgment to Satan and his kingdom. Jesus um, descended into hell and he made a public spectacle of Satan and his enemies and he you know, rose from the dead. So complete, complete judgment of Satan and his kingdom but it delivers Israel from judgment. So the church, the people who embrace the blood, are completely delivered from judgment. So it remembers what the Lord has done. The Passover remembers what the Lord has done. We remember what Christ has done. And it's something that's done for all time to come. That's the mandate that was given to Israel. So for us in the church, we continue that today effectively in communion. So in terms of symbolism, I haven't got time to go through and explain everything. Um, Paula and I have been blessed. We've been to um, two Passover seders in Israel. And it's, um, it's quite a, a joy to actually sit down. One of them was fully messianic. Um, the other one was with a group of Israeli soldiers. So a um, little bit different tempo. And um, in fact, and they really are joyous feasts. Um, everybody participates, there's a lot of noise, there's a, and in fact you don't get to start eating until after you've been going through probably almost an hour of this book before you actually start to eat anything, but by then you've drunk a couple of glasses of wine. So yeah, that makes it a particularly joyous feast. And um, there's even some specifications for the quantity of wine that you're supposed to drink. So, just to um, give us a little bit more context for Passover and where it fits, there are seven Jewish feasts. And the first one is the Passover, which speaks of the substitutionary death of Messiah. The second one is a feast of unleavened bread which follows on immediately from Passover. It's actually uh, after Passover, it's the next six days, and it speaks of the burial of Messiah. And then you have the Feast of First Fruits, which has to do with the resurrection of Messiah. Then later we have the Feast of Weeks, which is f seven weeks and one day, or 50 days after Passover, which speaks of Pentecost. And when, when Pentecost came, it was exactly 50 days after Passover all those other events. Then we have the Feast of Trumpets, which speaks of the return of Christ or the rapture of the church. In 1 Corinthians 15, 51, we read about all of us suddenly uh, the dead being raised in Christ first, the rest of us being caught up in the air, and all of this happens at the blast of the last trumpet. Well, good news is the Feast of Trumpets starts tomorrow, and it's a two-day feast. And the other thing to understand is that Jesus, the first four of the seven feasts, were all fulfilled perfectly in Christ in terms of timing and everything. So if you want to understand when the rapture of the church is going to occur, we don't know the date, we don't know the hour, but what we do know, it is going to occur on the Feast of Trumpets because it's prophesied that that's what's going to happen, the Feast of Trumpets. So every year when the Feast of Trumpets comes round, Get ready, <laughs> because that you could be launching. <laughs> so, you know, it, it's just fascinating how perfectly the feasts are fulfilled. So we've got four of the seven feasts fully um, fulfilled in Christ, and we've got three to go. And the Day of Atonement prophetically points to the Messiah's future work with the nation of Israel, and the Feast of Tabernacles speaks of the final judgment and the harvest. And the other thing to understand through here, are, uh, we use the word Messiah and Christ interchangeably, but they both have the same meaning. They both mean the anointed one. So when uh, the Jews speak about Yeshua HaMashiach, they're speaking, um, we, we say the word Jesus Christ. They're saying 
Jesus Messiah. And we're saying Jesus, the anointed one. When we say Jesus Christ, we're saying Jesus, the anointed one. So in the Last Supper, the context is that traditional Jewish Passover with Jesus leading it. So we need to create a visual picture. The table wouldn't have looked exactly like the one that I showed you. And the other thing to understand, the Passover feast has changed throughout the years. So even a traditional Passover today, all the symbolism is the same, but they're not sacrificing an entire lamb. Um, in the symbolism you would have seen on one of the plates there's a bone which is a lamb shank bone Uh, they'll eat roast lamb yes but they're not killing an entire lamb and consuming an entire lamb today even in a traditional Jewish Passover feast but they're, they're using symbolism so the feast has changed but the Psalms and obviously Prior to David writing the Psalms, Israel was celebrating the Passover for for many, many years, but without any of those Psalms being incorporated into the Passover feast. But with the Psalms and other scriptures being written, the teachers of the law and the priests incorporated a lot of that into the Passover Seder. So Jesus is sitting around a table with his disciples, they're going through a Seder that would probably be very similar to what's in this traditional one. Now, the other thing to understand, this is also a Haggadah. This is for a Messianic um, P- Passover. So for the Messianic Jews, Messianic Jews are still very big on following these um, traditions. And so most Messianic Jews every year will still go through the Passover because it because it's very powerful in terms of not only what it remembers but what it's prophesying for the future and it's prophesying not only things for the church and for the world but it's prophesying things for us individually so when we take communion at the end of this today what we want to do is to be prophesying our own future as well as the future of the church that's very important to understand If anyone wants to learn a lot more about Jewish feasts, this particular book um, called The Feasts of the Lord is written by Kevin Howard and Martin Rosenthal. You can understand one of those guys is Jewish, the other one isn't from the names. But um, it's a particularly good book that describes all the Jewish feasts and the prophetic importance of them uh, in quite some detail. So the context for what we call communion is Passover. So how would the disciples understand communion? What would they, what would the picture be in their mind, the early church and the first disciples? So they would obviously place communion in the context of a Passover meal. And the other thing to understand, when they actually had that last supper with Jesus, They had no understanding whatsoever of the prophetic fulfillment that was about to take place. It was only later that they would remember many of the words of Jesus. Jesus spoke quite a number of words during his time of ministry to his disciples that were talking about things that he was going to be saying at the Last Supper and things that were of great importance in terms of remembering his substitutionary death but there would have been no enlightenment at the time of that Last Supper. In fact, at the time of that Last Supper, when Jesus took a cup and said, uh, this is my blood that is shed for you, do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me, they wouldn't have understood what he was saying at that time. But the revelation would have come later when Jesus broke the matzah because what would have happened during the feast... At some point, Jesus would have broken the piece of matzo like this and he would have wrapped half of it up. And when he broke it, he would have said, well, this is my body that's broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And the disciples at that point would have been thinking, what on earth is he saying? You know, we're, we're, we're having a Passover meal. We're remembering what God did back in Egypt. So you can understand I wouldn't use the word confusion, but there would have been a lack of understanding in the hearts and minds of the disciples at the time that they were going through the Last Supper. So let's look at some New Testament scripture. Jesus said to them, 
very, uh, very truly, I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. You understand in the Passover, they were eating effectively the body of a lamb. And they were, the wine signified the blood of the lamb that had been sacrificed. So they weren't literally, they were literally eating flesh, but they weren't literally drinking blood. But it was symbolic of the blood. So in Passover, when they ate the flesh of the lamb and they drank the blood symbolically, death passed over. So what Jesus is now saying, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you don't have eternal life. Well, the difference is they got life because they got liberty and freedom out of bondage to slavery in Egypt. But we now have eternal life. That was a temporary life that still gave them, they were still subject to death because even though they left Egypt and they wandered around in the desert for 40 years and eventually wound up in the promised land, everyone was still subject to death. But when we eat the flesh of Jesus and drink his blood, we have eternal life. And he says he'll raise us up at the last day. For my flesh is real food and my blood is real drink. And whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father. So the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your ancestors ate manna and died. But whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. Interesting when the Jews broke the, um, the, the uh, matzah during the Passover feast, the prayer that they would pray is, Baruch Ada Adonai Eloheinu Melecha Alam Hamotzi Lechem Min Ha'aretz, which is, Praised are you, Adonai our God, ruler of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. And here it says, your ancestors ate manna and died, but whoever feeds on this bread, bread, will live forever. And Jesus refers to himself as the bread of life. He is the living bread that came down from heaven. More prophetic symbolism. So then came the day of unleavened bread on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. And Jesus sent Peter and John saying, go and make preparations for us to eat the Passover. Where do you want us to prepare for it, they asked. He replied, as you enter the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him to the house that he enters and say to the owner of the house, the teacher asks, where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs, all furnished, make preparations there. So they left and found things just as Jesus told them and they prepared the Passover. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table and he said to them, I've eagerly desired to eat this parcel with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. But the hand of him who is going to betray me is with mine on the table. The Son of Man will go as it has been decreed, but woe to that man who betrays him. They began to question among themselves which of them it might be who would do this. It's interesting in this scripture. You notice in verse 17 it says, After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you. And then he says, I'm not going to drink this again until the kingdom of God comes. And then he takes the bread and he breaks it and he gives it to them and he says, This is my body. And then after supper, he takes another cup and says, This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood which is poured out for you. Well, the reason you have a cup and a bread and a cup is because during the feast there are actually four cups of wine that are consumed and it's actually talking about two different cups of wine. Another thing to understand about Passover, there was a lot of preparation. In the traditional Jewish um, 
fashion, if they're preparing for a Passover, they'll take a week to prepare for a Passover meal. And one of the things they have to do is to remove the leaven, the chemets, from the house. The other thing that's interesting, they're not even allowed to own anything with leaven. So if a Jew has a particularly expensive and lovely bottle of Scotch whiskey in his house and he owns that bottle of whiskey, he's not allowed to own it during the Passover. So you you got some choices, haven't you? So what they did, they actually came up with a, um, a system whereby they could sell everything that they owned to the rabbis and they could put it in a locked room and seal it up with tape and then after Passover they could buy it all back. <laughs> they could redeem it. So there you go. <clears throat> so there's some pretty interesting things in, in terms of the Jewish um, um, festival. So you have to make sure that you've got Passover matzah. You've got to do the shopping to accumulate everything required for the Passover. Then you'll set the Seder plate and you'll set the table as you saw. So it's a very joyous feast. Um, when you actually go through the, um, the Seder, what happens is it obviously you, we tell the story of the Exodus and all the miracles. It's all listed. All the scriptures are there. You eat mozza, lots of it. Um, and then you drink four cups of wine at set times, and those cups of wines have to be a minimum of 86 mils each, which isn't a lot, but um, they tend to drink a lot more. That really is a joyous feast. Um, the one Passover we went to with the, uh, the Hebrew soldiers, by the end of the feast, everybody really is quite tipsy because they actually do, f in the instructions, it actually tells you to fill your wine glass to the brim. So, and when they drink the wine, they're not sipping it. They scull it down and move on to the next part of the Seder. So you can imagine how joyous it becomes. So you really want to use small wine glasses. So then you eat a bit of vegetable, you eat a meal, and then you sing songs of praise to God. Okay, So that's the typical thing. So the Messianic Passover is also a joyous feast. Um, a lot of times when we do communion, we tend to be focusing on uh, the fact that Jesus saved us from our sins. And whilst that in itself is joyous, we can be pretty somber sometimes and think, well, am I worthy? Um, you know, all this sort of stuff. But the actual real story behind these feasts is restoration of fellowship with God. That's it. So how much joy, uh, can you imagine that you were, I mean, it's like being in solitary confinement in a prison for years on end and all of a sudden being set free. You're going to be pretty joyous. Well, that's, that's what's happened. We've been in a prison. We've been in bondage to slavery and sin. We've been set free. We need to have the utmost joy at what God has done for us. It's a time of extreme joy. So just to go through the four cups briefly so that we can understand a little bit more symbolic um, symbolism even in the cups of wine. The first one is the cup of sanctification and it was based on the God's statement, I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. God has brought us out from under the burden of slavery to sin and um, the devil's kingdom, because Egypt was a type, if you like, of Satan and the demonic kingdom. Then there was the cup of plagues, which speaks of the judgment upon the kingdom of darkness and our deliverance based upon God's statement, I will deliver you from slavery to them. And then there is the cup of redemption, the third cup, which is based on God's statement, I will redeem you with an outstretched arm. And then finally, there's the cup of praise, or restoration based on God's statement, I will take you to be my people and I will be your God. So from those four cups, what you can understand, when Jesus first said, um, take this and share it amongst you because I'm not going to be doing this until the kingdom of God comes, that was the first cup. That was the cup of sanctification. But when he actually said, take this, this is my blood which was shed for you, we're now well into the Passover Seder, and that was the third cup. That was the cup of redemption. 
So Jesus, by doing that, was actually committing a, an extremely prophetic act in doing that right at that time in the Passover Seder. So just to go through some of the structure so that you'd understand, we're going to run over just a little bit. Is that okay? So the Haggadah commences with lighting candles and it symbolizes that Jesus is the light of the world. Once again, the Jewish people had no idea that by lighting these candles, they're symbolizing Jesus is the light of the world. Then we have scripture and a prayer affirming the deliverance from Egypt and bondage to slavery. Then there's the affirmations in the first cup. Then there's washing of hands, which signifies purity. And it's also a time to reflect on Jesus' gesture of humility when he washed the feet of his disciples. And today, in a lot of messianic seders, they will actually incorporate a foot washing into that, um, pass, uh, that seder celebration. Then there's the affirmations to eat a bit of herb, normally parsley, which is dipped in salt water. Once again, more symbolism. The salt water, well, the parsley represents life and the, the um, salt water represents the tears that were shed in Egypt. So for us it would represent the tears that are shed whilst we're in bondage to, um, to sin and all that sort of stuff. And then you go through four questions and answers, which gives children in particular the whole meaning of the ceremony. And then you have the matzah, the bread of affliction. So we call it, so even this was called in the Passover the bread of affliction. And, you know, we know that Jesus was afflicted for us by his stripes. We are healed. So... Once again, the stripes and holes signify the suffering of Christ and his body that is broken for us. And then you have the uh, afikamen, which is, sorry, the one that's wrapped up and hidden in the house, which signifies Christ wrapped and hidden in the tomb. Isn't it amazing the extent to which God hid all of this symbolism in the Passover feast? that it was all there and we can, at the time, nobody would have even been aware of it, but it was only subsequent to Jesus' life and death and resurrection that these things even really became apparent because they were remembering the past. They didn't fully understand the future that they were prophesying. The uh, priests and the teachers of the law would have understand that there was prophetic significance, but they completely missed Jesus when he came. So then there's bitter herbs that are eaten with matzah, the bread of affliction, which is done to have compassion on those who are in bondage. Then there's bitter herbs on matzah dipped in a sweet mixture of chopped apples, honey, nuts and wine, which signifies that even the most bitter of circumstances can be sweetened by the hope that we have in God. Well, isn't that amazing that even the most bitter of circumstances can be sweetened by the hope that we have in Christ. We can come out of the kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of light. Then the reclining at the table could mean comfortably sitting, which signifies freedom and becoming a kingdom of priests. And then the, the story of the Passover is about God remembering his covenant. And then you've got the second cup, which is the cup of plagues, which is a symbol of joy at God's mighty deliverance. And then we go through and we review all those scriptures. And then after you've done all of that, and that takes about an hour or more, that's when you actually commence the Passover supper. And whilst you're having the Passover supper, as I said, the children go off to find the Afikaman, which can be redeemed by the head of the table. And the other thing that's very important is once this Afikaman is redeemed, it's broken into more pieces and shared amongst everyone at the table. So this is, this is the most um, closely aligned to what we do with communion because we take bread and we break it and we share it amongst everyone. And when we share that um, piece of bread, what they wouldn't have realized in the Passover is it represents the body of Christ. And we know that by his stripes, we're healed. What people would do, they would eat part of that afikamen at the time of the feast. But a lot of traditional Jewish people would still take a piece of that bread 
and they would take it and put it on their bedside table or they'd put it away somewhere safe. And if they ever got sick, they would seek out that piece of bread and they would eat a piece of it and they would receive their healing by faith. Isn't that incredible? So for thousands of years, they were doing that and then Jesus comes and we know that we receive our healing by faith because by his stripes, we are healed. Hallelujah. Then they have the third cup, which is the cup of redemption, which symbolizes the blood of the Passover lamb. Jesus said, this is my blood. What he was doing was identifying himself with a Passover lamb. At this stage in the feast, they have a child open a door to, sig- uh, to welcome Elijah the prophet to the Seder, which is symbolic of John the Baptist coming in to um, herald Christ to the world. Then they have the fourth cup. Um, and at the time before you drink the fourth cup, there are many statements and uh, of praise and thanksgiving given to God. And then there's a song that is sung uh, or a psalm, and then you drink the final cup. And then there's the traditional wish, Lashana Habada, Yerushalayim, next year in Jerusalem, and the Passover Seder is finished. I think it's important for us to realise that when we do communion, communion contains significantly more power even than the Passover. There's a lot more to communion than there is to the Passover. Firstly, there's the divine exchange. And secondly, there's Christ's completed mission. And we don't have time to go through all this information, but I'm just going to flash it on the screen so that you can get a brief impression of what is contained in this. So in the divine exchange, Jesus was punished that we might be forgiven. He was wounded that we might be healed. He was made sin with our sinfulness so that we might be made righteous with his righteousness. These are all things that happened on the cross. Every one of these things was accomplished through Christ. And now I'm just going to flick through the next six slides. We're not even going to dwell on them, but I want you to see Christ's mission that was completed and the scriptures that support Christ's mission that was completed on the cross. And you can see as we go through these six slides, it's just a very long list of what was accomplished for us on the cross. So when we take communion, anything that we're missing in this life that was accomplished on the cross, we prophesy it into existence in our own life. We take communion by faith. It's not just a ritual that we do in a service. It is something that is of vital importance that we understand not just the significance of it, but the specifics of it. Because you can't appropriate something by faith if you don't know what it is that you need to appropriate. Hence the importance of being in the word, studying the word, studying the scriptures, understanding what Christ has done for us, and then appropriating it and receiving it by faith in your life. So when we talk about prophecy in communion, so every promise in the word that's not fulfilled in our life, For instance, Jesus was wounded that we might be healed. So we are healed and we will be healed. So we're now looking at some of the prophetic things that we're actually talking about. None of us are necessarily going to ever be fully, completely and utterly healed, walking in divine life and divine health in this life. But we can believe God for it. We can take communion believing for that health and healing in our bodies, but we will be healed. Even if you go to heaven sick and broken, you will be healed. Jesus was made sin with our sinfulness that we might be made righteous with his righteousness. Well, we are made righteous and we will be righteous. He tasted death for us that we might share his life. We participate in his life now, but we are going to enjoy his life forever. He was made a curse that we might receive the blessing. Well, we are blessed, 
but how many people could do with more blessing in their life? I know I could. You know, but we will be blessed. We're going to be at a point where we won't need any more blessing in our life. He bore our shame that we might share his glory. Well, we participate in his glory now, but this is only a mere shadow of what is to come. We will participate fully in his glory. He endured at my rejection that I might have his acceptance with the Father. Well, we are accepted and we will be accepted. We're prophesying the future, our individual future. We're also prophesying the second coming of Jesus and the marriage supper of the Lamb. So with that, I think what we'll do is we'll hand out some communion elements and we'll take communion. And I'll just share a few words as we do that. So while that's going around... I'm going to put these um, um, things on, the, these things I'm going to leave here and if anybody wants to take this um, hug at a home uh, or ask any questions on any of this, I'm very happy to, to answer those afterwards. And I will say, you know, I'm by no means an expert on any of this material. Um, Paula and I are, are blessed that we've been to um, some proper, you know, some full Passover meals in Israel. That was a very special experience that we had. And I think there's always more to learn from these things. What I would encourage you to do is to think about your own situation, your own life, your own circumstances now. What do you need from God that you haven't fully received? If you've got sickness in your body, you need to be able to believe God for your healing. We all know the scripture, by his stripes, I am healed. You know, that's not just a New Testament scripture. That was, that's Old Testament. That's Old Covenant. That was Isaiah. That's why the Jews would believe that with the Ephikamen. And they would actually receive their healing because it was prophesied. We can prophesy our own healing. We can prophesy our own deliverance. We can prophesy our own deliverance, uh, our own blessing. Because all of those things are made available to us through the cross of Christ. Let's sing a song before we actually take communion. The head that once was crowned with thorns Is crowned with glory now The Saviour now to wash our feet Now at His feet Oh, yeah.
stand and sing together. His victory. Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it. Oh, I feel the anointing. And he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. This is his body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. But as you do it today, also do it prophetically and believe that by His stripes you are healed. Let's receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Jesus, for your broken body. Amen. Let's eat together. Hallelujah. Likewise, after dinner, Jesus took the cup of redemption and he said, this is the blood of the new covenant that has been shed in my blood. He actually would have prayed a prayer, which is Baruch Adah Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaAlam, Barei Pri HaGafen, praise to you, Adonai, our God. He was giving honour to God. Praised are you, Adonai, our God, ruler of the universe, creator of the fruit of the vine. And we know Jesus is the vine. We are the branches. The fruit of the vine is the church. We thank you, Lord, for your blood. We thank you for forgiveness and remission of sins. We thank you that by your blood we are made righteous. And as we drink this blood, we partake and participate in the inheritance of the righteous, which is preservation, healing, wholeness, and prosperity, spirit, soul, and body. Thank you, Jesus, for your blood. Amen. The tomb where soldiers watched in
shout, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for resurrecting life, Lord. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for resurrecting me, Lord. Amen. The power of communion, the power of the death and resurrection of Jesus, all oh, that we would really understand. And this morning we've been given a tremendous insight again to value communion. Healed, we are the healed this morning. We're alive because of the blood, set free because of the blood. Father, we give You thanks, Lord. And Lord, we go out from this place in resurrection life, Father. In resurrection life, Jesus. Thank You, Lord. If anyone needs prayer, please come forward for prayer. Enjoy fellowship. Stay for a coffee and have a blessed, blessed week in resurrection life. Remember, resurrecting. You are walking in resurrection. Amen. In Jesus' name. Be blessed.